uh, oh, we're not moving into committee. We're just doing this out in the open. That's fine. So can I have someone to move us um, into, uh, so we start can start our committee meeting? Don't all speak at once. Just start the meeting. Okay, we will I, just. I second, sorry, I was waving, not mute, not speaking. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, um, as I explained earlier, I'm working from home with a new, uh, different system because our internet and air conditioning and everything collapsed at the office. So um, I'm uh, adjusting the system as we go. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, we do have, uh, Coralie is not able to join us. She sends her regrets. She's here, uh, she's here. Oh. I'm here, I may just have to pop off, my apologies. Okay, Carly, I'm sorry. I just uh, wanted to pass on your regrets. Okay, I'm glad and we're thinking of you. Okay, so um, over to our guests to make the presentation. Lovely, good morning, all of you. I'm very pleased to once again be able to come before this committee. Uh, it really is truly a pleasure and I've appreciated the opportunities to begin to get to know some of you and hear some of the things that you're wanting to bring to life as a, a in your responsibility with this committee. So I'd like to bring uh, myself into this circle by acknowledging in a good way uh, the lands that I am on. I'm on the traditional and unceded territories of the Sainage people. I'm very grateful to the keepers of these lands and also hoping that the heat breaks soon because I'm quite concerned about the four-leggeds and the wingeds and the and uh, the humans as well, the two-leggeds at this, uh, this time. So I hope that wherever you are, you are safe and cool as best you can. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm supported today by uh, Deputy Representatives uh, Samantha Cocker and Alan Marquardt, okay. as well as Executive Director of Communications, Jeff Rudd. And there are two other members of our team and I will introduce them or they will introduce themselves shortly as we begin to talk about the report. So the primary purpose of our time together today is to talk about sky. And I just wanna begin by sharing my screen with you. Because one of the things that I find really helpful is to situate our work with an understanding of who we're talking about. So this report, Sky's Legacy, a focus on belonging is centered around Sky, but also understanding that Sky has connected historically her mom, her grandmother, and the generations before, and the ancestors and the people in her community. And um, I just want to share a little bit about Sky. So, as a young child, she was cheeky and mischievous with a great sense of humor and an infectious laugh. She had a zest for life. She was a child who bubbled with energy. You can actually see it in the photographs. She was a young person who needed to be busy and she was able to channel her energy through activities such as rock climbing, swimming, horseback riding when these were made available to her. And she loved being in nature, uh, particularly going fishing and riding horses. In fact, fishing was described as her Zen. She had a really deep connection with animals. She was intelligent and inquisitive. She would always state her opinions and was never afraid to let people know how she felt. In her own words, she was a wise person, an owl, and the kind of person who was assertive and who, who would, quote, stand up for her friends. She wanted to work with children. Whoops. She wanted to work with children herself in the future and in fact contemplated a pediatrician or being a counselor. And one of the people who we spoke with said that she would have made an extraordinary child and youth care worker or social worker given her depth of empathy and understanding. So Skye needs to be understood too in the context of her family. So her mom was described as a talented artist. In fact, her work appears at the front and the back of our report. She created beautiful quilts, paintings, beadwork, and medicine bags. She was described by people who knew her well as a smart and articulate woman with an awesome sense of humor. She was generous and she had many friends who loved her. It was evident through our work 
that Skye's mom wanted the best for her daughter. And in fact, there were many times where she recognized that in her own journey of healing that she wasn't able to provide the best for Skye. So she would approach the ministry and ask for some help and some voluntary arrangements were made for a period of time. In fact, what really shone through as we took on this work was how much Skye and her mother loved each other. So I'll stop sharing there and and move into talking about our report and what we did and what we discovered. Uh, so just bear with me as I, there we go. So it was important for our office to tell Sky's story in a good way, um, in a way that um, brought her to life and uh, helped us really deeply understand the story that needed to be told in order for the learning to happen. So before we get into the details, I'd like to introduce uh, or ask two of our staff who were involved in this report to introduce themselves to you. Um, so joining us today are one of the Indigenous staff members who played a lead role in this project, Caitlin Alder, as well as RCY's Acting Executive Director of Reviews and Investigations, April Fox. So April and Caitlin, would you mind, actually, let's start with you, Caitlin, would you mind introducing yourself to the committee? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Ani, good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin Alder and I'm Anishinaabe from Nout Kamegwaneng First Nation and Territory. I'm really grateful to be joining today from the traditional territories of the Esquimalt, Songhees and Wasanich peoples. I um, joined RCY a year ago um, and worked on the Sky investigation for the greater period for probably about 10 months. And um, coming into this investigation, I have a, a historical um, experience working with the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, as well as working frontline child protection uh, as a social worker, um, working with youth who had very reflective stories to that of Sky. And so I, was really privileged and honored to have had helped carry her story out into the world. And I really wanted to share, ensure with the utmost integrity that her story was told in a good way. Um, really capturing her spirit and capturing more about who she was rather than simply what happened to her. And I, I feel like that work um, couldn't have been done without our other staff member who unfortunately isn't here today, uh, Jody Bosch is our uh, Métis and she brought forward Sky Story and really, really carried it through for the last two years. So I just really want to acknowledge her and, and the work that she's done. So i um, honored to be here with you today and looking forward to the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Caitlin. And over to you, April. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is April Fox. I'm phoning in from the traditional unceded territories of the Claytley Tene Nation, also known as Prince George. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm currently the acting executive director for reviews and investigations and have for the last two basically get the report out, out the door and into the world. And it's been a great privilege to support the team to do that. Um, I have a long history with RCY. I've been here for coming up to 13 years within the advocacy program area and really happy to be here with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you, April and Caitlin. And uh, uh, Caitlin's mentioned Jody Bosch, who is also a key member of the team. And I also want to speak into the circle, Monique Auger, who led the project in the early stages and actually was the one who got us on a path of thinking about Indigenous research methodologies and the approaches there. Uh, there were many others involved, Carly, uh, um, whom you know she's presented here before. Uh, she's over at the office, our sister organization, Human Rights. Uh, uh, Human Rights Commission, um, but she also was very involved. So lots of people that bring these uh, important stories forward. So um, none of us knew Sky or her mother personally, but through the eyes of the people who cared about them, we learned a lot during this investigation. Through the process, we also grew to care about them. I just want to tell you a little bit about our approach because it's um, 
it's important to understand the investigation, the ways in which we bring investigations forward. And with this committee, this is the first investigation that we've brought forward to you. So any investigation that we do, the story is an exemplar, if you will, of stories of many, many children. And when we take a look at these things, we think this is a story that's important to tell because it's going to lead to understanding and improvements in the system for many children. Uh, the other thing that's important about this particular story is the investigation team that researched and presented Sky's story was led by Indigenous RCY staff members. We're very fortunate to have almost 20% of our staff are Indigenous and we need to do even more and, and better in that regard. So the research methodology used by the team has been significantly influenced by an Indigenous worldview in which it's understood that there are multiple stories, perspectives and truths that are relevant to any situation being considered. So these diverse stories and perspectives contribute to a more fulsome and holistic understanding of the child and particularly in this case of Skye and her family and the people connected to her and the situations and challenges that they faced. So in, as you well know, an Indigenous worldview is not linear, it's circular, and it understands that everything is connected. And thus, that helps us make sense of the very complex situations. So let's talk for a moment about the context. So we released this report on June 10th during a period of significant trauma and grief for Indigenous peoples in BC and Canada, and it, it's continuing today. The release came less than two weeks after the discovery of the 215 lost children by the Tecumloops Tishwetlik band on the former site of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And we debated about whether it was appropriate to bring this report out at that difficult, at that particularly at that time, wondering if we would cause harm, whether it was just too much pain. So of course we do, uh, we did what we do, which was we went to the leadership First Nations leadership, and we went to the chief of Sky's Nation. So after consulting with the leadership and with the blessing and participation of Chief Wanda Pascal from Sky's uh, Tetle Kwichin Band, we decided that it was important to move ahead with it. In fact, Sky's story lifts up and reinforces all that has been coming to light since that discovery and the more recent discovery of 751 children in Saskatchewan. As all that the elders, matriarchs, leaders, survivors, and family members have told us, the impact of settler colonialism and assimilation and elimination practices, such as the residential school 60 scoops, 60 scoop, the millennium scoop, continues to affect the well being of Indigenous children, youth, and families. And as I mentioned, I chose to investigate Sky's story because it, back then, because it reflects the story of many First Nations, Métis, Inuit and urban Indigenous children and uh, youth that my staff and I see in our day-to-day -day work and our advocacy and our reviews and investigations, um, how little, uh, we, we had no idea how prescient this would be. So I want to acknowledge that much has changed in the Ministry of Children and Family Development's practice, policy and legislation over the last 20 years since Sky was born. Um, and there are many positive changes underway. And we speak to that within the report. However, we continue to be aware of and involved in many situations similar to Sky's, where a young person experiences a lack of connection and belonging to people, to place, culture, and to a sense of themselves, a positive sense of themselves. And as a consequence, experiences much pain, sadness, distress, risk, and of course, poor life outcomes. <clears throat> we continue to see situations in which children are disconnected from their families and communities of origin due to what's often perceived or presented as a problem with the parents and family members, rather than the system understanding the vulnerabilities in the context of historical and contemporary trauma, racism, stigma, shame, poverty, and a lack of timely accessible and culturally attuned opportunities to heal. So I'm gonna make a link here to the residential schools. Um, and on the surface, the heart-wrenching discoveries in Kamloops and Saskatchewan and the tragic death of Skye on her 17th birthday might seem unrelated, um, but in fact, as we know, they're different chapters of the same continuing saga, the story of colonialism and the devastating damage it has done and continues to do to First Nations, Métis, Inuit and Urban Indigenous children, families and communities across Canada. 
So the children in Kamloops, found in Kamloops and Saskatchewan were separated from their parents, siblings, extended families, territories and cultures as a result of the residential school system that ripped them from their homes and incarcerated them in abusive and dangerous facilities. Sky wasn't born until 2000, a few years after the last residential school closed its doors. But she too was removed from her mom, her sister, extended family and culture as she became part of what many have described as the modern day residential school, the child welfare system. So turning to Skye and their life challenges, both Skye and her mom faced tremendous challenges in their lives. Skye's mom was removed from her family home as an infant and adopted to a non-Indigenous family during the period known as the 60s scoop. And Skye herself was removed from her mother's care when she was five years old and never saw her again despite expressing many times that she wished to have a connection. During her time in care, she endured three failed adoption plans, lived in eight different foster homes, moved 15 times and attended eight different schools. Both Skye and her mother experienced abuse during their childhoods, both experienced mental health and substance use challenges, but both could have had better lives. They might have had a lasting relationship with one another, and they might have had different fates had they been better supported to deal with their past traumas. So it's important to note that there were many people who cared about Skye. She was much loved, and some worked very hard to support her. However, the overall response of the child-serving system led to what Dr. Martin Brokenlake calls unbelonging. And as he also goes on to say, every human needs deep connections and to feel a sense of belonging. The way the system responded to Skye and her mother fractured that sense. Our report explored the five dimensions of belonging that are important to all children. Sometimes they're known as the dimensions of permanency, but we decided to frame it in a different kind of language and talk about belonging, which resonated for the Indigenous advisors that we spoke to. So it's important to all children to belong, but it's particularly important that we bring care and attention to that if a child's in care. So relational belonging, belonging to a sense of people and, and having meaningful connections, cultural belonging, physical belonging, have a sense of place and connection to the land or to the, the schools and the places of, of importance like for sky, nature, um, an identity and belonging, and of course, legal belonging, or sometimes uh, focused on adoption. Our main finding is that the focus by MCFD on legal belonging or adoption came at the expense of all the other forms of, uh, of belonging and permanency for Sky. That focus, um, which by the way, we acknowledge in the report was fueled to a certain extent by our work in the office that privileged adoption for a period of time but nonetheless, uh, and obviously continue to learn, all of us, but that focus resulted in three failed adoption plans for Sky before she was 12. And these took a heavy emotional toll on her and resulted actually in the heartbreaking severing of a continuing relationship between Sky and her older sister. Potential placements for Sky with extended family were not fully explored and a nurturing placement with an Indigenous foster plan family was inexplicably severed, as was a relationship with a longtime and trusted counsellor. Skye's life was chaotic, with multiple moves between placements and communities, and she wasn't provided opportunity to connect with her extended family or her Dene culture in any meaningful way. One of the things she wanted to do was to go to her home territory um, and near Fort McPherson in the Northwest Territories. And in fact, she did a lot of her own independent research and she clearly expressed a desire to do, to, to visit her territory and connect to her culture and neither were meaningfully supported. The cumulative result of all of this was that Skye wasn't able to realize the true sense of belonging that all humans need and seek. And she seemed to be constantly searching for a sense of her own identity, who she was and, and how she mattered. And she was looking for those meaningful connections throughout her short life. Sadly, however, it ended with a tragic overdose death in August of 2017 on her 17th birthday. 
Important to note that this report was not about blaming individual social workers for what happened to Sky. There's no one person, decision, or event that caused the poor life outcomes for Sky and her mom. Instead, it was the cumulative impact driven by misplaced priorities of the system and ingrained attitudes towards parents who use substances. Sky was clear about what was important to her, but her voice was often not heard. Sky's mother desperately wanted to be a part of her daughter's life, but wasn't properly supported for that to actually happen. Many people cared about Sky over the years, and there was some exceptional practice by individual workers, particularly workers towards the end of Sky's life. But overall, tragically, it wasn't enough. So what has to change? As I said earlier, much has already changed in MCFD practice policy and legislation in the past 20 years. And there are many positive changes currently underway, including the Federal Act respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis children and families. However, we can have the best policies and the practices and the infrastructure, uh, but colonialism still reaches into families through the intergenerational and historical trauma that too often goes unrecognized or ignored and therefore unsupported. And through the structural bias and systemic racism that's built into, that's hardwired into our systems, and these negatively affect the services provided and by extension, the outcomes for children, youth, parents, and grandparents. Colonialism's influence on the child welfare system is particularly evident when you consider that more than two thirds of the children currently in government care in BC are indigenous, despite the fact that indigenous people comprise less than 10% of the child and youth population. And according to MCFD's most recent service plan, an indigenous child is nearly 18 times more likely to be removed from their parents than a non-indigenous child. And for many of those children, we continue to hear stories about experiences of disconnection from belonging. There's a promise of positive change ahead with the federal legislation enabling Indigenous nations and communities to reassume jurisdiction over their child welfare, but this process is not happening overnight. And while this transformation unfolds, it's important for MCFD and delegated Aboriginal agencies to take steps to ensure that Indigenous children currently in its care or to come into care, can achieve the sense of belonging that they need and deserve. I made three recommendations to address the immediate actions required. First, I recommended that MCFD conduct a systemic needs analysis of cultural and family support resources required to ensure that workers are better supported to promote a sense of belonging and identity for First Nations, Métis, Inuit and urban Indigenous children and youth in care. And I recommended that this process include a substantive investment of new resources by April, 2022, the next fiscal, and that that be considered a down payment of sorts on the resources identified in the longer term plan. Now, why was that important? Is that one of the things we noted, and in fact, have affirming evidence through our care plan review that I'll speak about a little bit later, is that oftentimes workers, social workers and uh, guardianship workers don't have the resources that they need or the expertise that they can access to enable them to better understand what are the family supports, what are the extended family connections or the cultural or, or community connections that could be created to support that young person. So we felt that it was very important that that be taken a, a look at very closely and enhance the resources that are available. I also recommended that MCFD reviews and re review and revise all relevant care planning and case management standards, policies, practice guidelines, and training materials with the goal of aligning those materials with the dimensions of belonging as described in this report. What we learned through the consultations, particularly with our advisors, was that language matters deeply. The concept of permanency has been in use for many, many years and we aren't necessarily questioning what that means anymore. As soon as you introduce a notion of belonging, which all of us can feel, we know who we belong to and where we belong. Um, so when we bring the, that new language in, it actually shifts, can help us shift mindsets as well. Uh, finally, I recommended that in the interest of improving practice and support to all staff who work with and plan for children and youth who are in care, or who may come into care and then meaningfully engage in discussions with those staff about belonging for children and youth in the context of case planning, decision-making and the development and implementation of care plans. Now, 
I've got a bit of pushback on that recommendation. It's like, well, that's kind of a process recommendation and is it really going to affect any change? Um, but there's an intention behind why we decided to have that recommendation because we were feeling that there's a receptivity to doing the work differently. And this is a, an opportune time and particularly in light of what's unfolded over the last month and a half. So the ministry has been receptive to Sky's story and I can say with confidence they've been moved by it. And to give you an example, I was recently in a large gathering of MCFD staff and one of the participants who'd been, been involved in Sky's care, in fact, spoke about the impact that the story had on her. She was grateful for the tone and the approach that we didn't single out individuals or events that caused Sky's situation, but in fact spoke about the system. But what was important to me was to hear how she spoke about questioning and examining her own practice in her relationships with Sky. And she wondered how she will do her work differently now. In fact, she said, I will do my work differently now. I am carrying different kinds of questions, different kinds of awareness. And she had, uh, it was beautiful because this is in front of 150 of her colleagues that she was doing this reflection and sharing what she has learned. And that's what we're in this for, is to try and see those kinds of discussions, reflection, analysis, so that it's not just a report, but it's something that draws people in to examine what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how it could look different. And through that, that will ripple out to programs and to policies and to the ways in which the work gets done. So we're in discussions with the ministry leadership and uh, practice um, leads about how we can help spread the knowledge gained from this report to MCFD staff province wide and what this will look like and feel like so that the title of the report, Sky's Legacy, becomes a reality. I've also had conversations with the delegated Aboriginal agencies and met with their practice leads and they too are embracing this and in fact they want us to do a companion piece that says here are the ways that we can foster belonging. So this is a beginning of a conversation that will carry on for uh, some time and really what it's, what's important is to get below the surface to the structures, the processes and the mental models that affect how we engage with young people. It's a strong message about the importance of belonging in a young person's life and about how everything possible must be done to ensure that belonging. Sky wasn't given the opportunity to realize the belonging that she needed and deserved. And it's my hope that sharing her story in the way that we have will enable other indigenous children and youth such as her to do so. And in fact, all children and youth who come into care. It offers us all important teachings, including in the circle, and when we know better, we must do better. So that concludes the formal part of my presentation and I'd be happy now to answer any questions and to have a discussion with members about this report and of course, ably supported by um, members of the RCY team. Thank you for a very thorough uh, going over the report with us. And uh, I can say that uh, to what you heard from uh, a staff member at the ministry that uh, I was also very touched by the way this story is being told. And I think uh, I always like when we uh, do our teachings through stories uh, mm -hmm. because I think it really, really hits home. Uh, data and everything is good for those of us who are data geeks, but... Uh, to get to the heart and to honor uh, this beautiful young woman. I think this was very well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Ready? I have a number of people on the list and I'm just going to go through them in the order that I saw them and uh, then we will proceed. Uh, Mike? Uh, thank you, Chair. So, uh, you know, very, um, um, very uh, detailed report. I appreciate the work that was gone into this. Frustrating, though, reading that because, you know, I, I see and, you know, I've worked my whole life uh, in small communities, uh, a lot of times with disadvantaged youth. Um, I've got a family member who's a manager of a designated agency, uh, 
uh, here in Prince George, and uh, she's read the report as well. We've had a lot of discussion uh, uh, about it. Uh, a lot of it boils, you know, it, it's the same old, same old that we see continually that has gone on over years, over decades, in fact. And, you know, I like uh, some of the recommendations. Um, social services, in my view, in my experience as a police officer and and uh, and politician, I guess, and just in general, just because I've had family members involved, are so under-resourced. Uh, they are overwhelmed. Uh, social workers are dropping like flies just because they can't handle the caseload. Uh, they don't get involved in some of these areas that are extremely busy because of that. I'm just wondering what kind of, of, uh, of reception, I guess, you've had from the senior managers within the ministry itself uh, with respect to um, recommendation number one. Uh, they need to have some light at the end of the tunnel here. And that's, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, 2022 as a down payment and getting some of these uh, these um, resources out there. I think it's paramount. I think we need to do a lot better than we have been doing. There's so many falling through the cracks these days uh, because of the, 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 I guess, the intensity of the drug supply out there and the types of drugs that we have here. But just the problems are just so so huge where do we start and and uh, you know by by sending a lot of these things back or or giving uh, uh, the um the authority back to a lot of the first nations groups when i when i lived with the niska uh, you know the matriarchal society was very strong and the house chiefs were responsible for peace and order within the houses and and let, let's bring that responsibility back and give those folks the tools that they need in order to take back the the uh, the authority and the the good work that they've been doing in those uh, smaller communities. And maybe it'll transcend into the bigger urban communities that we have here as well. But a good report, a good story. But it's it uh, it's the same. There's there's a million stories like that right across the country and right across BC here. So um, I, we have to start somewhere. It's like going on a diet. I guess there's no uh, it's, it's never too late to start. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you have done over your career too. And, and, and your insights into the complexity. I think that's critically important. And I, I agree with you. The thing that we struggle with a lot um, is seeing the same stories repeat themselves. So that's why skies was so important. It's like, we have to figure out what are the, what are the measures that can be taken so that we're not continually receiving these kinds of stories. So I guess a couple of things, you asked reception from senior managers in the ministry, um, very strong, very supportive. Um, because of the way in which we do our work, there were no surprises for them in doing this so that they've had lots of time to consider. Of course, as you know well, um, the in terms of the resources, that's a fiscal uh, requirement and uh, Treasury Board will have to consider that. So the ministry has not said definitively that they would be, you know, they would allocate resources because they have some processes to go through. But uh, my sense is that in, uh, the, that they have accepted the, three recommendations and we'll move forward as need be. In terms of where do we start, I think you've identified the, the experiences in many nations with strong practices from uh, traditional practices. Nishka is an excellent example. Um, really trying to figure out how do we support and ensure that there's capacity there over this coming time, that's going to be critically important. The other thing that I think is important is that Sky's story started when she was born with her mom and the kinds of supports that could have been provided to her mom, who was wanting very much to heal, but from her trauma um, and was doing the right things with respect to reaching out and asking for help and whatnot, wanting to go to treatment. We really think that they, we need to back up the bus. And I'll talk about that a little bit because it's, it's very hard to change the trajectory at 15, 16, 17, 18 years of age. We need to figure out how do you support families? Um, so that, and I guess that, you know, the same old, same old, there have been lots of recommendations, hence the reason to not talk about just policy or more resources, but to talk about 
hearts and minds and centering our practice from a from the concept of what could we do differently that would enhance that sense of belonging because what we see so often is everybody is doing their job but they're not seeing how their jobs connects with other and how you know a, a piece of a, a decision over here could have ripple effects over here so it's really about trying to change the system and we're committed to continuing on the process. Uh, sorry, that's a long-winded answer. There's no simple solution because of the complexity. And the toxic drug supply, man, that changes a lot too. So we're just going to have to keep going and trying to make sure that this is a very meaningful um, uh, embracing of the learning from Sky. So I hope that helps. Thank you. And uh, Henry? so much for our report and i think it was actually one of the hardest report for me to read because it's so story oriented and so relation relationally oriented and like you mentioned one of the things that hit us really hit me really hard is the continuous effort from the mother's side trying to fix the situation and yes yeah, the lack of support in re, uh, responding it i actually have, do have a question about the report or a specific or a story part about it in the middle section around i think when she was about 11 and 12 years old there's quite a few times she she was sort of removed from a family that seemed to be working out that both the sky and the, her foster family both seemed to be functional but for some reason the mcfd decided to go in and remove her child and did not provide explanation and that's what kind of shocked me a bit and it, it seemed to have, have a continuous become a theme through a lot of the storytelling of sky's story is a common practice for mcfd to remove a child without provide explanation or oh, is that specific circumstance of confidentiality? That's the reason why it was not provided. Yeah. So it builds me my lack of knowledge here. No, no, these are, uh, as usual, excellent questions, Henry. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to respond um, uh, at one level, but I'd also like to invite you, Caitlin, as a practitioner, if you wish to speak about the, you know, when moves happen, what are the kinds of explanations provided? But you're absolutely right that at, um, at that really critical age of 11 and 12, what, we, what happened was Sky was in a, a stable foster home. And this is what we spoke about a lot, that the, the orientation towards adoption and what was called forever families was so profound that they didn't take a look at, well, how is she doing right now? And what's her context? And what is she saying she needs? What does she want? Um, and bring her voice in. Um, so adoption was kind of paramount. Get the, the child into a forever family. We have somebody who's interested in her and you know, they seem like a good family. Um, over, well, how is she connected and who is she connected with and how is she doing right now? And what are her, her, her voices or her, her perspective? Where's her voice in all of this? And that is something that we see quite a bit of um, decisions being made somewhat in isolation and what with a lot of curiosity about how the child is doing right now. The other thing that I want to emphasize is how critical that 11 to 12 year old period is. We often see that that is kind of the threshold moment where a child might be doing okay and then significant decisions have been made in their life and it's a, it's a, it's a real challenge thereafter. So it's one of those things for us to take a look at developmentally and encourage the system to take a look at developmentally. Understand the context for the decisions that you're making and understand the developmental trajectory for that child and what they need. Um, but maybe can I turn it over to you, Caitlin, to talk about the kind of notification for, I think it's all over the map in all likelihood, but. Um, yes, uh, thank you for uh, asking me to weigh in here. I, um, I have several years experience working um, frontline child protection where I did work for a delegated Aboriginal agency uh, and was the guardian of many children in care over the years. And so from my experience, um, I guess one explanation can be that while Skye was very, very stable in the home she was at at the age of 11 and she was very well bonded and she was with a First Nations family, which was really, really great for her. Um, unfortunately, as a contracted caregiver of the ministry, um, that placement could not be seen as permanent or, or as a plan for permanency for Skye. And although we do mention in the report that uh, the ministry did approach the foster family asking if they would adopt Skye, 
the family advocated that she was not yet ready given the breakdown that had happened years prior. And so um, with that in mind, the ministry took that as, well, they're unwilling to adopt her, so we need to move her to an adoptive permanent home as quickly as we possibly can. And that kind of took precedence over and by the foster family. And um, one of the issues that we did also mention in the report was there was very little acknowledgement or even um, priority to ask what Sky wanted in that situation. She was moved very, very quickly once a family was identified. Um, now, I don't know if that move to an adoptive home is a common practice across the board for many children, but we could see that it did take precedence over um, planning for Sky's best interest in finding her that forever family. And, and it really sadly backfired and it was an unfortunate part of the story that we, we had to acknowledge. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank Does that answer you. your question, Henry? Okay, thanks, good. Okay, Karim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer and team, um, for this work. Uh, uh, these might be a bit more technical, but just a statement first is uh, trying to find a social worker is like a unicorn sometimes. And when we were trying to match um, vulnerable young people to social workers, it would take days and weeks to connect them. I would love to, and this isn't partisan because it's been an issue for many, many years, we have got to invest in social workers and hiring social workers. And one of your recommendations is providing resources to social workers. So when a social worker's got, I don't know how many hundred um, uh, young people they're, they're dealing with, uh, I love the, the people with MCFD, I think, do a fabulous job, but it cannot not it impact your ability for decision making and for you're tired and there's so many things you're considering. So I think some very bad decisions were made along the line here and the issue with permanency and taking um, Sky out of a home where there was love and support and, and I'm glad that's been identified uh, that that's a challenge. Um, so question, it, uh, is there a team of care with young people in some way where you don't have a single um, social worker, This I might be totally wrong on this, making a decision as impactful as the one, for example, to move Sky out of that stable foster home? Is that, it, I, I believe people have to have decision-making authority, but when there are things like that, is there a team that makes that decision or is that one individual person? Yeah, good question. And I would say um, it's never one person because a social worker would be consulting with their team lead or perhaps a practice consultant and whatnot. Um, in some cases, though, um, there might be just a couple of people involved. In other cases, with very and we see this a lot, um, in especially with children with very complex lives, that there is a large team around them. Um, however, the that doesn't necessarily lead to the the ideal outcomes or the best decisions, and that's driven by a number of things. Um, Resources, availability of resources, um, continuity of relationships. So as was noted in the report, there were 18 social workers who were involved in, in Sky's life. So no one really knew her in the sense, and sometimes she was on her own and there hadn't been a visit for almost a year. Um, and the availability of resources, so that often affects things like, well, you don't have a placement that's appropriate, so we're going to move you to this community, or we're going to take you out of here because we're going to need to, we need to put another child in there. And it's uh, so resources is a significant challenge. Placement resources is a, is a significant challenge. So even with the best intentions of teams, they might not be able to execute what they think is the right thing to do, either because they don't have all of the information, the knowledge, or they don't have sufficient resources. Um, so your point is well taken that social workers are struggling in order to, and, and Mike said the same thing, social workers are struggling to do the right thing. I think though that there are some models in place that we can you know, learn from and scale up in terms of that kind of um, really good decision-making and deliberation and ensuring that uh, the child's voice is heard 
and it can be done quite successfully. And so there are models that we can draw on um, around the province. I don't know if other members of the team want to step into that. Um, I might weigh in quickly just to add, um, when you're talking about models and frameworks of practice, um, one of the frameworks that we do speak to within the report is the Aboriginal Policy and Practice Framework, which I think is um, probably what you're looking for in terms of a, a more collaborative process of planning for the child, where there's meaningful engagement with the child's nation, engagement with the child, the family, and ensuring that the entire circle is uh, wrapped around the child and the family making those decisions together and not solely um, on the heels of the, the social workers who are trying to plan for forever for this child. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. I have uh, Kelly next. All right, I will, I will try to, to sum it up. I wanted to say thank you um, for you know, the decision that was made by the writers to not attach this to um, you know, the personal characteristics or you know, any, any developmental issues or any specific trauma that so often allow people to dismiss um, a situation because, oh, well, that's only because you know, she fill in the blank. Um, and so I, I want to thank you for that decision because I think that it's very important. Um, I, I am curious to know if uh, part of the legacy will be for this report to, um, you know, be shared with our schools of social work um, in hopes that they'll include this in their curriculum, include this in their, their, their things that they know before they're starting their careers. Um, and my question um, actually came as it was a little bit of surprise for me to not see more explicitly in the recommendations um, the issue surrounding um, Indigenous foster homes and the potential causes or contributing factors to that. Um, the, the description in the report itself may, you know, it, it seems quite apparent there, there's perceived lacks of respect and, and there's, you know, uh, definitely colonial standards of safety and ideas of what makes a home safe. Um, and I'm wondering which recommendation you think um, tackling that would fall into. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, great questions. So just wanted to pick up a um, couple of things there. Um, Schools of social work, schools of child and youth care, um, counseling programs, et cetera. So the next step for us is we're developing a knowledge mobilization strategy that will allow us to take the report out into many different contexts in the ways uh, and to influence hearts and minds, if you will. So I've already been in conversation with them. Um, folks from a couple of the schools. Uh, we've got a good relationship with the BC Association of Social Workers. Um, and so we'll continue to do that because you're absolutely right. This is a teaching story. It's great to get it at the front end of your career before you're actually doing the work. So that is part of our, our strategy uh, um, to do the knowledge mobilization and make sure that we take the story out in a good way. In terms of Indigenous foster homes, you raise a really, really good point. We could have done a recommendation on that. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges we always face is where are we going to get the greatest uh, impact through our recommendations? With respect to the Indigenous foster homes and the, and the points made in the report about how the system is constructed to dissuade people from becoming foster parents, Indigenous folks from becoming foster parents. My hope is that when we bring the story into the ministry with the ministry, that they will be taking a look at their policies, their practices, their guidelines, the training, et cetera, to try and figure out what do they need to adjust and the foster care, the ways in which they um, recruit and support and value Indigenous foster parents is a key part of that. So my hope is that it will be woven into that work. If I'm reading your lips properly, Jenny, did you say Susie? Sorry, I had muted. Uh, Susie, it's you now. 
Excellent. Um, so my, my question or commentary also follows along with what Kelly was saying. The first piece of it, and uh, you know, I've been a clinician for a zillion years, is the assessment tools and how they're applied and, and how we look at things in terms of what's safe, what's not, how do, you know, how do we accept because um, my perception is having been a foster parent for many years and having been having had a social worker come into my home who was 24 years old, had no children and wanted to teach me how to manage the seventh foster child in my home because we did short term while they figured out what they were doing with kids. Um, it, it, absolutely. The way that assessments are done and the way decisions are made really desperately needs to be looked at. And also following on what you had to, how you responded to Kelly. Um, the other piece is that, and I, I hate to be mercenary about this, but there is no incentive to adopt. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, if you are fostering a child, there is money involved there. The care needs of the child there's money involved if you adopt that that funding dries up and you're expected to in, absorb this child into your family without having supports in place to to uh, allow for the things that a third child entails and I think that if if we were wise what we would do is we would have a transition five years or something that says okay if a family's prepared and willing to adopt and have all the other structure in place, it behooves us as the guardian figure. I don't care what we call ourselves, and guardian is terribly colonial and terribly wrong, but that, that we provide the resources to transition that child into the family and support and, and ensure that the supports are in place fiscally to, to uh, support a third child or a fifth child or whatever it is um, in conjunction with the other kids that they've already got and the other family commitments that they've already got. Um, and, and I also, I'm frightened to ask if there was a difference in uh, rates to Indigenous families versus non-Indigenous families. Mm. Uh, but my bet is that there was a difference and, is a, and there may still be a difference. Um, so those are my bits and pieces because again, it's, it's a massive issue and you can parse out different strings of it, but the, all the strings I think need to be identified and that's gonna be a wicked job for somebody. Thank you. Right, thank you, Susie. You raise a really, so well, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to share, assessment tools. Um, you're absolutely right. Many of the assessment tools, the parental capacity assessment, the structured decision-making tools, the things that are being used are very colonial. Um, and they are very much defined by, you know, what, uh, what a family should look like rather than embrace the diversity of families and how they might get that might get expressed. So we flagged for the ministry probably a year ago. Alan, you may want to step in on this one over a year ago, are interested in taking a look at all of those assessment tools and how they are being um, understood or whether they're appropriate uh, given what we know now. And so the ministry has been working on that and we're due to get a very thorough briefing. Um, actually, it was supposed to be tomorrow afternoon, but because of some people being away, uh, we've postponed that until September, but um, we will be getting a thorough briefing and taking a look at all of those, all, the whole range of assessments um, and, and what they're doing to ensure that they're less colonial and they're also embracing the diversity of family and how best to support Tied into that, we'll be taking a look at how is it that instead of those tools being weaponized in some cases against families that have certain characteristics, how is it that the focus can be around supporting those families? So that leads me to the transitions for adoption. Um, uh, there is the post-adoption supports. Many people say that that's not sufficient. Um, so it's obviously an area to continue to look at. The other thing that I wanted to put in there, though, that in addition to the post-adoption supports, that's constructed on the basis of adoption looking very typical. But as we move towards um, resumption of jurisdiction um, and beginning to think about the different ways, in fact, we speak about custom adoption or customary adoption in the, in the report, we have to be mindful that, a, you know, what we think of as belonging and long-term connection or adoption in another word is gonna look different. And those families are no less deserving of that kind of physical supports that will address the special needs and the healing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a conversation that needs to unfold. 
um, and welcome um, Samantha or Alan to speak into that if you wish. In terms of the rates of foster home, there isn't, uh, they're not discriminatory in the sense of Indigenous foster homes getting less than non-Indigenous foster homes. It's more on the basis of how are they seen in terms of their, the, the levels that they're at. Um, that's not to say that there is an implicit bias or those kinds of things showing up because that's what is, that's what systemic racism is, um, but there isn't anything that's in policy that would differentiate. Samantha or Alan, anything you'd like to add to those comments? Uh, no, not, not really. And by the way, I'm not hiding. I'm having video problems uh, this <laughs> morning. The, um, uh, I, we do know the ministry has been doing some fairly substantive work on the assessment issues like parental capacity assessments, risk assessments, um, and the very fact that they acknowledge there's a need to uh, kind of move forward on that is uh, is welcome, but we just uh, haven't had the details uh, yet of where they're at. And stay tuned. Thank you very much, uh, Jen and team. I just want to make sure I'm un unmuted. Thank you very much uh, to you and your team for spending this time with us. And now, Jennifer, I believe you're just going to give us a quick... Uh, update on your upcoming reports. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for your attention to this report. Sky is very near and dear to our hearts. And um, so I appreciate the time that you've, care you've taken to, to learn about her. So a couple of things I wanted to do is to just give you a sense of what is unfolding and what you can expect come the fall. So right now we're undertaking an annual review of our strategic and operational plan. Um, and that articulates the vision, mission, goals, strategies, and priorities of the office, as well as our kind of program of what are we going to do. So just to give you a sense of over the next 18 months, we'll be focusing in a number of areas, Indigenous child welfare, all for about today, including supporting the resumption of child welfare, um, special needs, uh, children and youth with special needs, or as the ministry now calls it, children and youth with support needs, um, mental health and substance use services uh, for children and youth, those transitional support services, including housing for young adults who've left care and are on enduring responsibility to them. Residential services, which I haven't spoken much about at this committee thus far, but particularly for those with very complex needs. Um, rights, children's rights, um, and as I've mentioned before, those kind of early support and intervention services to better assist families in staying together and support children in those critical early years and care planning. So those are sort of the big buckets that we're working on. Um, now, more specifically, our reviews and investigations team will be completing a second report on child participation, voice and representation in legal proceedings. And this complements the one that we brought to you in January, detained rights of child, children and youth under the Mental Health Act. And this second report, uh, which will come out in the fall, probably October, or late October, early November, will focus on child participation in child welfare and family law proceedings and those highly contentious, difficult decisions that get made and sometimes children are caught in the middle. The reviews and investigations team will also be connecting, commencing a new investigative report um, similar to you know, the investigation process that we've done for Sky, and then also doing an aggregate report on critical injuries and deaths involving girls with complex needs, because that's a cohort that we see over and over again, that there's lots of people involved and nothing seems to be sticking. These children have very complex co-occurring mental health substance use, exploitation, uh, housing instability, et cetera. So what are we gonna do there? So moving over to our monitoring team, uh, now you know that uh, we presented Excluded, Increasing Understanding, Support and Inclusion for Children Youth with FASD and their families, and we're so grateful to the way in which you've um, held that report in such a good way. And um, we're planning an extensive knowledge mobilization strategy around that report, which will enhance the awareness, understanding, and action in support of children and youth with FASD and their families. 
And this knowledge mobilization strategy or knowledge transfer is a new approach for us. We've never done that before, but we hope to enhance the reach and systemic impact of our work. And you'll be happy to know that Miles Himmelrich, whom you met, is um, has joined us on contract, and he will be co-creating that knowledge mobilization strategy with our team, with Pippa's leadership, and uh, that will be flowing out and have many different tentacles out. We've already got bookings with school trustees and, or, and principals and vice principals and school counselors, et cetera, to try and address the education side of things. And we'll be moving in many other areas to try and in, increase the impact of that report. Um, the monitoring is also nearing a completion of quantitative, uh, a, a quantitative and qualitative review of care planning for children in care that focuses on cultural planning for Indigenous children planning for youth transitioning into adulthood and permanency planning or belonging planning, as we would use the language now. And uh, that will be released and presented to the committee in the fall, likely again, uh, probably in, um, uh, in parts, maybe in October and November. But one of the things that's key here is this is not one that's going to capture a lot of uh, public attention. Our main role there will be to assist the ministry because they're doing a review of their health care planning process and are awaiting the results of our review, a very in-depth review, to assist them in that work. Um, monitoring is also leading the development of the public RCY report on the early years, um, including an examination of how the families, families can be kept safely together, so building on Sky and her mom's experience and the economic and social value of prevention and early intervention. And they are beginning work on a range of issues related to contracted residential care services that are funded by MCFD. And we are working on two public reports um, on the unique needs of and services for gender minority and sexual minority youth. And this work's being done in collaboration with university researchers and, and our other, the other RCY teams. And the reason for that is we do see a very different kind of profile for uh, gender minority and sexual minority youth in terms of the in injuries that they experience. Um, and felt that it was important that we brought a, a deeper lens to that, their experience in with the system. And uh, the cool thing is that through all of this work, we've built partnerships with universities and research institutes so that we can amplify and bring the best available evidence to uh, inform our work. And then one final thing that I'll mention to you is, uh, or two things, one is that our First Nations Métis and Inuit Relations team is, um, doing some work right now with the University of Ottawa's Institute for Fiscal Studies and Democracy, and that's a comprehensive review of provincial and federal funding of services to Indigenous children and youth in BC, with a focus on child welfare services, but also including prevention, et cetera. And uh, we, that too will be coming out the latter part of um, the fall. Um, and the key thing with that is that we're doing that in collaboration or in, in communication with delegated Aboriginal agencies who are opening up their books and helping us understand the reality for them and with the First Nations Leadership uh, Council so that that will inform or assist in the resumption of jurisdiction because we'll have a better sense of the dollars and cents. Uh, so that gives you a sense of some of the major reports that we're working on. And then the uh, final thing I'll say is you will also be gifted with our annual report and service plan uh, that needs to be uh, submitted to the Legislative Assembly by September 30th. And of course, there will be a lot of things in there about COVID and all of the adjustments that we've made, the things that we've learned, the impact that we've seen. And I will give you a bit of a, a sneak preview in that our caseload has been going through the roof this year with respect to re re reportables and um, uh, critical injuries and deaths in large part that's due to the ministry doing a much better job in reporting but it's also I think indicative of the other stressors and, and pressures that the uh, our young people are experiencing so we will we'll delve into that and you can look forward to that by September 30th so that gives you a sense of where we're putting our energy and why uh, a little bit about why and also what you can expect to see in the fall so happy to have any questions or comments there uh, thank you, Jennifer, for your um, 
update of your work plan. I want to know what you're going to be doing during the daytime. <laughs> it's a, it's a very ambitious and a very comprehensive and a diverse set of issues you will be looking at and um, and we're looking forward to you coming back and uh, keeping us updated and having further discussions. Thank so, you so thank you to your team and you for the work you do and um, I'm hoping it cools down enough so we can actually get out there and enjoy the summer. And I don't have to watch Henry fanning himself because it's too hot in his office. We get uh, it, Henry. Anyway, sure, I think thank you. Susie has Matt, a question. Yes. And for the committee, we are going to take a comfort break. And Madam it, uh, let's Chair, hope just, everybody is back by 12.15. Madam Chair, Susie has a question. Oh, sorry, uh, Susie? I, I just wanted to say thank you for the incredible work that Jennifer and her team are doing uh, in so many ways to look at, um, turn over so many rocks that have been haunting us all for a very, very long time. Um, and what it speaks to is a team that is truly committed and truly um, feels supported and resourced to do the work that they're doing. And I think that, uh, that we need to try very, very hard to emulate that in within the tentacles of uh, MCDF to make it so that they feel uh, able and and because I've, I've so, met so many people that often, you know, I want to do that, but I can't for whatever reason. I you hear it all the time and I, I just want to figure out how to get beyond those things. So thank you. Sorry, I'll stop talking now. Hey, thank you. I see no other hands up and uh, so Comfort break, let's see you all at um, 12.15. And uh, once again, a big thank you to Jennifer and team. Um, take a little break. <laughs> <laughs> we got stuff to do. <laughs>
bring the committee back to order. Okay, now that you all look orderly, let's have someone move us in committee, please. Okay, moved Mike, seconded Kelly. All those in favor? All those opposed? That's great, we are now
teaching right now. And I am going to be looking for movers. Uh, move Coralie. So Coralie, if you could read out the motion. And a seconder, do I need a seconder, Susan? No. Okay, okay. move I Coralie. Move Thanks, Jenny. I move that the chair of the Select Standing Committee on Children and Youth deposit a copy of the committee's report entitled, oh, Susan? Oh, sorry, the motion on the left. Oh. Can, can you see it? Yes. I move that the Select Standing Committee on the Children and Youth approve and adopt the report entitled Annual Report 2021 as presented today and further that the committee authorize the chair and deputy chair to work with committee staff to finalize any minor editorial changes to complete the supporting text. Okay. All those in favor? I can't see any of you, so if Coralie raises her hand, I will presume all of you have. Okay. All those opposed? This motion carries. Coralie, would you move the second one too, please? Sure. Thanks, Madam Chair. I move that the Chair Select Standing Committee on Children and Youth deposit a copy of the committee's report entitled Annual Report 2021 with the Clerk of the Legislative Assembly and further that upon resumption of the sitting of the House or in the next following session, as the case may be, the Chair present the report to the Legislative Assembly at the earliest available opportunity. All those in favor, I can see you all now. Awesome, it carries. And we are now done the business of the committee today. And uh, as this is uh, going to be our last meeting, I presume for at least about another month, uh, I wish you all a very happy and restful summer. I hope it cools down. Um, we have, uh, I don't, I'm not going to say you have two or three months off now because you know as MLAs, this is maybe going to be the busiest time coming up now. And especially as there'll be more gatherings and things. So there will be an expectation for us to be out there. But I also want to thank each and every one of you for the very professional way you've done your homework for each committee and uh, for the debate and discussions we've had. So enjoy everyone and um, to our staff before we leave. Um, as you said earlier, Susan, it says the chair or it says the committee, but we know who does the real work. So to you and all the staff, a big shout out and thank you. And I really do hope that you get a total break and enjoy the summer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, the meeting is now officially adjourned. Should we have someone move to adjournment or no? Okay, Henry, would you like to move adjournment? Sorry, I just don't know. It's just on the protocol. <laughs> no, no, no. I love it. I love protocol. Moved Henry. Seconded. Seconded Kelly. All those in favor. This is my favorite. All those who never want to adjourn. Okay, great. Have a good summer.